I now come to looking at Stalin's dialectical and historical materialism. I'm going to be focusing on the dialectical aspect because the historical materialist aspect is not so controversial. And I will delve into also the texts of Engels that um, Stalin relies on in places. <coughs> He sets out four principles of dialectical materialism. One, that nature is connected and determined. Two, that nature is in a state of continuous motion and change. Three, that natural quantitative change leads to qualitative change. And four, that contradictions are inherent in nature. I'm going to, in this video, critically consider the first three. Number four, I'm going to leave to a video on Mao's On Contradiction, since Mao goes into this um, question of contradictions in much greater detail. So let's take the first principle. And I'm quoting from the text now. Contrary to metaphysics, Dal Electics does not regard nature as an accidental agglomeration of things, of phenomena unconnected with, isolated from, and independent of each other, but as a connected and integral whole in which things, phenomena, are organically connected with, dependent on, and determined by each other. Now, this is absolutely orthodox materialism, orthodox mechanics. In the 1930s, there had been a vigorous debate between the mechanists and the Deborahists. But here, in Stone's 1938 dialectical materialism, he starts out with an assertion that would be entirely acceptable to either a classical or a quantum mechanist view of the world. That is to say, a view of the world based either on classical mechanics or on quantum mechanics that nature's determined was a fundamental was fundamental to classical mechanics it was a deterministic theory whether expressed as it originally was in newtonian terms or as it later get formulated in the 19th century in terms of hamiltonian mechanics the that nature is connected via action at a distance forces was a fundamental assertion of Newton. And this was the most controversial of Newton's um, postulates because the idea of an action at a distance force, force that could be transmitted through a vacuum, seemed very strange when he put it forward first because up until till Newton, Mechanics was still the mechanics of Archimedes, the mechanics of Archimedes' fundamental machines, where everything is in terms of contact, forces brought about by contact. In quantum mechanics, the same connectedness applies. To those of you who have read a little on it, think of the einstein podolsky rosenberg thought experiment to do with... Um, separated particles with um, what you would now say is entangled properties. And the physicist Bohm referred to this as the implicate order of reality. So an assertion that nature is deterministic and connected is not something specifically dialectical. If dialectical materialism holds this thesis of, of um, Stalin, it's because it's a faithful follower of mechanical materialism. Second thesis, nature is a state of continuous motion and change. Contrary to metaphysics, dialectics holds that nature is not in a state of rest and immobility, stagnation and immutability, but a state of continuous movement and change of continuous renewal and development, 
where something is always arising and developing and something is always disintegrating and dying. Again, this is from Stalin's Dialectical Materialism. That continuous motion and change exists in nature has been asserted by all materialists since Lucretius. Here's a bit a quote from Lucretius. After the revolution of many of the sun's years, a ring on the finger is thinned on the underside by wearing. The dripping from the eaves hollows a stone. The blent plowshare of iron imperceptibly decreases in the field, and we behold the stone paved streets worn down by the feet of the multitude. The brass statues too at the gates show their right hands to be wasted by the touch of numerous passers-by who greet them. Now in Lucretius' case, he's giving this as evidence that the world is made up of tiny, imperceptible atoms that are in continuous motion. But that the nature is a state of continuous motion and change was the fundamental thesis of atomism, of Lucretian atomism, as it, it was passed down to us in the present period because so few of the texts of Epicurus and Democritus have survived. So motion underlies any mechanical theory of dynamics, any theory of mechanics that involves change in time. All statistical mechanics too is based on this same idea of constant movement, that the atoms are in constant movement. With Marx, Engels and Darwin, this idea of movement and change gets extended to society and biology. In fact, you could say it isn't uh, extended to, to society initially by Marx and Engels. It, it was extended by Adam Smith, but the texts of Adam Smith, which really constitute an earlier foundation of historical materialism, his lectures on jurisprudence, only get, get, got published in the 1970s, so they were not available to Marx and Engels. So this idea of nature being in a continuous state of motion and change is atomism or historical materialism and biology. It's not something specific to dialectics. It's accepted by anyone who accepts those sciences, the uh, science of atomic physics or of historical materialism or of biology. Now we come to the more controversial part. As I was saying, the previous parts are just common to all materialisms. The idea that quantitative change leads to qualitative change. This idea is not an idea which originates in materialism. It's an idea which originates in Hegel. And Stalin cites Hegel, cites Engels, and in the text where he's referring to of Engels in Dialectics of Nature, Engels cites as his authority Hegel. And he quotes this passage from Hegel. Thus, for instance, the temperature of water is first of all indifferent in relation to its state as a liquid. But by increasing or decreasing the temperature of liquid water, a point is reached at which the state of cohesion alters and water becomes transformed on the one side to steam and the other to ice. And this is from Hegel's Encyclopedia. And this is a text dated 1812. Engels goes on. Similarly, so this is Engels now, immediately after he's quoted Hegel. Similarly, a definite minimum current strength is required to cause the platinum wire of an electric incandescent lamp to glow, and every metal has its temperature of incandescence and fusion, every liquid its definite boiling and fusion and freezing and boiling point. The so called physical constants are, for the most part, nothing but designations of the nodal points at which quantitative addition or subtraction 
of motion produces quantitative alteration in the state of a body concerned at which, therefore, the quantity is transformed into quality. Well, that's not what the physical constants are. Physical constants, in the main, are ways of converting different units, different dimensions. Um, but so, so you'll get C, the, the speed of light, is a constant for converting time into distance. But leave the thing about the physical constants. What about this business about the electric light? Nowadays we use tungsten wires, not platinum wires, but it's the same thing. Water boiling is a phase, what we now call a phase change. But incandescent lights don't have a definite threshold current at which they light up. If you've ever used a bulb with a dimmer switch, you know that as you switch it on, they initially start out with a dim red light. As you turn the dimmer switch on, the light shifts in colour towards orange and initially they then they become yellow or almost white. You can still see some yellowness in them, in an incandescent bulb. If you have a, a halogen bulb, it gets to almost white. Now what's happening here? This is not, there's no sudden phase change. There is no definite current at which it starts to glow. It is a continuous process of change. Small changes in current produce small changes in the colour of the light. And it's governed by the black body radiation equations. What Engels is doing is confusing a phase change phenomena with what's just ordinary black body radiation. If you, on the other hand, have a modern LED light, which didn't exist in his time, you will find, yes, there is a threshold voltage at which the LED light will start to emit light. But why is that? It's because, as Einstein showed in 1905, light itself is quantized. And you need a certain voltage threshold in the LED or in the diode in order to create the holes and pairs which will recombine to release light at a certain energy, photons at a certain energy. So in Engels's account, he's confusing the issue of continuous change with the idea of step changes. And let's look at the original example of a phase change. This quote from Hegel, on which it's all based, is a loose way of talking about phase changes. And it misses out the most important thing, which is that when you boil water, there's a step change in the entropy. There is a huge amount of energy required to change the phase here. You get a step, a step in the entropy function. Now that's missed out in Hegel's account. And it's not as if it wasn't known. It was known to late 18th century science by Professor Black at Glasgow University had worked this out. So, but he, Hegel misses that out because he's talking in idealist philosophical terms about quantity and quality. And what is quality? This is something from idealist philosophy. The notion of a phase change in entropy is something from modern scientific materialism. And of course, as we say, for the light bulb, there's no such step function. It's a continuous function. Again, suppose we have a modern boiler for a modern thermal power station. These are often supercritical boilers. That is to say, they work at above 3,200 pounds per square inch. At above that pressure, liquid water and steam become indistinguishable as phases. 
So a supercritical boiler has water pumped in at the top. The water flows down a, curl, a, a convoluted pipe flowing in the opposite direction to the flow of the hot gases from combustion. By the time it reaches the bottom, it is steam, but there is no phase change. It just rises in temperature because the whole pipe is operating at over 3,200 pounds per square inch. You can dress this up in the language of quality by saying that above 3,200 uh, pounds per square inch, there's no qualitative difference between water and steam. Or you can say something more precise and that above 3,200 pounds per square inch, there is no step in change in entropy as, the, as we heat the water up from into steam. So what counts as qualitative change? What counts as quantitative change? Is Engels referring to whole numbers or to a continuum? It appears in the example of the current and in the example of temperature that he's referring to whole numbers, to, sorry, to, to a continuum. He misses out the important um, conceptual element of the entropy, but he talks about heat or temperature, which is a continuous variable. So what, what have we gotten so far? That the definition of qualitative change is vague. Nowadays, we have a more precise concept, that of phase change. And this is given a precise meaning in modern uh, scientific discourse. Phase changes certainly exist, but not everything Engels says is a, quanti uh, a quantity to quality change actually is a phase change. Even the water to steam one only occurs at certain pressures. So it's not a general rule that quantitative change leads to a phase change. It's only certain phenomena. Certain physical systems have this property. Engels goes on to talk about chemistry. The sphere, however, in which the law of nature discovered by Hegel celebrates its most important triumphs is that of chemistry. Chemistry can be termed the science of qualitative change of bodies as a result of change quantitative composition. That was already known to Hegel himself. As in the case of oxygen, if three atoms unite into a molecule instead of the usual two, we get ozone, a body which is considerably different from ordinary oxygen in its odor and reactions. Again, one can take the various proportions in which oxygen combines with nitrogen or sulfur, each of which produces a substance qualitatively different from any of the others. Now, think a little about what I said about what does he mean by quantity. Does it mean a continuous variable or does it mean the discrete variable? He's switching from a continuous scale like temperature to integer numbers of atoms. Now the integer number of atoms is a necessary consequence of the atomic materialist theory. The atomic materialist theory right down from Lucretius or Democritus is that there are smallest elements, atoms. Lucretius doesn't call them atoms, he calls them smallest bodies. That there, there are smallest bodies. And if there are smallest bodies, any composition must contain an integral number of them. And what Engels is doing here is attributing to Hegel what was actually the discovery of someone else, John Dalton, who published his New Chemical Philosophy in 1808, four years before Hegel, Hegel's text. And it is Dalton's New Chemical Philosophy which re-established atomistic materialism 
as the foundation for chemistry, which it has been ever since. That chemical compounds are formed by an integer number of atoms was a key postulate of Dalton. And it's not an expression of some idealistic theory of quantity into quality, that, uh, it, that, which Hegel invented later. Hegel didn't come up with this property of, uh, of chemical compounds. Dalton did, and Dalton came up with it because it was a necessary consequence of the atomic theory. If there are distinct elements, and if these distinct elements are made out of atoms, then it is necessarily the case that a molecule must be made up of integral numbers of atoms of different types. And this is absolutely fundamental to the, to the argument in Dalton and it's fundamental to the illustrations in Dalton's book. But that doesn't explain why this idea of quantity to quality had such a grasp on people. And it's basically because it had a political appeal. By borrowing this idealistic hypothesis or idealistic law from Hegel, social democracy could make statements about quantitative change leading to qualitative change. And these were a metaphor for the idea that the increased size of the German working class and the increased size of the social democratic vote were going to lead to socialist revolution, were going to lead to a qualitative change from capitalism to, co to socialism. So the social democrats were very sanguine in the early years of the 20th century. They were sanguine about their prospects. They thought, we're going to do well. Our vote is steadily building up. And they had this philosophical belief that quantitative change must necessarily lead to qualitative change, that this aggregation of their vote would inevitably lead to the qualitative change from capitalism to socialism. They were sanguine, but we know that the actual process was sanguinary. The actual process was the SPD went along with this and lost its revolutionary ideology. It became a party accommodated to capitalism. It supported the First World War. Not only did it do that, it culminates into the SPD collapsing into social patriotism and the first time the SPD form a government they get the fascist Freikorps to murder Luxembourg and Lenin and Leibniz the, the leaders of the actual socialist element within the SPD. So this idea of quantity to quality was nothing but Hegelian idealism in the first place and became a cover for social democratic reformism. 